to the Anderson forecast, and I'm sure that Ed Lemer and our experts left you with uh, a lot to think about, about the nation in California, and I hope a sliver of optimism, uh, despite what Ed says. Layer on top of that the election season, and you do have a lot to think about and maybe to worry about. My, my role and my pleasure is to introduce our keynote speaker, Peter, Peter Lowy. And if you're looking for a leading global expert in commercial real estate, you need look no further. You found it in Peter, who is the co-CEO of Westfield Corporation and on the board of uh, the Global Corporation as an executive director. Westfield, for those of you who lived under a rock, is among the world's handful of leading shopping mall companies uh, in the world with retail destinations in London, New York, San Francisco, uh, Los Angeles, among its portfolio of 34 malls and about 6,500 retail outlets, uh, depending on the day. Recent developments and plans include malls on the side of the World Trade Center, which is opening in August, expansion of the Century City Mall in LA that many of us frequent, retail expansion at LAX, thank God, Peter, it's very boring there otherwise, construction of a mega mall in Milan, beginning soon, and Westfield is also planning more than 3,000 apartments around its malls in uh, Westfield, London, and Stratford City in the UK. So some mega expansion plans here. Last year, Westfield malls prompted about 400 million customer visits to Westfield shopping centers, many of them mine, uh, generating over 16 billion in retail sales. Peter has been with the Westfield group since 83 and is one of uh, the most experienced and sh savvy shopping center and real estate investment executives in the world, and, and you'll hear that. Uh, his very succinct summary of the Westfield strategy is to seek the best assets in the best markets. Wouldn't we all want that? Before Westfield, uh, Peter was an investment banker both in London and New York. Here in LA, he serves as chairman of the Homeland Security Advisory Council for LA County, a big, a big job, and also serves on the RAND Corporation Executive Committee and Board of Trustees. He was just appointed on the Investment Advisory Council of the US Department of Commerce. He's on the Executive Committee of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, and he also serves on the Board of Directors of the Lowy Institute for International Policy, a very important institute in Sydney. He's got a bachelor's degree from the University of New South Wales. And, and he talks about transforming the mall experience for customers and, and, and that the uh, mall should be so showcased as the customer's hero. Well, how do you become a customer's hero if you're a mall? Well, one of the things that you can do is put red and green lights on every parking spot so that when you drive through, you're not going crazy to find a parking spot. And yes, it leaves you more time to shop with a relaxed mindset. Now, some might argue that now is not the most propitious time to be in bricks and mortar retail. I've heard Peter say that he sees technology as an opportunity for traditional retail to become more engaged with online retail, to get closer to the end customer, to create new experiences for consumers while they're inside the mall, and for malls and retailers to build stronger and more personalized connections to their customers. That's a quandary that I'm sure Peter has thought about and will address. Peter is a fellow Aussie, though a much better surfer and snowboarder than I am. Please welcome Peter Lowy. Thanks for that, Judy. Thanks for that, Judy. Um, after listening to Ed, I can see half the people here have left. They're all going to sell. <laughs> half, the people, half the people cleared out. Um, we have about 45 minutes. I don't really like to talk that long. Uh, so what I'll do is just give you a, a short presentation, about 10 or 12 minutes, and then I much prefer answering questions. So, uh, so here we go. 
So Judy, thanks for that introduction and I'm pleased to be here at uh, UCLA with uh, a whole bunch of friends and colleagues from the industry. And as Judy said, uh, at Westfield we are an uh, internally managed, virtually in, virt vertically integrated regional retail group. We have interests in 34 malls in the US and the UK, uh, as again, comprising 6,500 retail outlets. That's about as far as you got, Judy. Now I can do the rest. Um, our strategy is really to create and operate flagship regional retail assets uh, in leading markets that deliver great experiences for the retailers, the brands, and our consumers. At the moment, we have assets under management of about $29 billion. We are in the middle of a $10.5 billion investment program in those current assets. And by 2020, when we finish our development program, the value of the asset should exceed some $50 billion. So this is a pretty big business on a, uh, on a wide scale. What I'd like to do is to share how we at Westfield see the commercial real estate markets today, outline some of the strategies that we're using to navigate the changes in the financial markets, <coughs> excuse me, uh, changes in the retail sector, especially due to technology, and changes in consumer shopping patterns. First, though, I think I'll start with interest rates since we had the forecast and, every, as I said, everyone's run out to sell. Um, since 2009, the Federal Reserve has maintained a near zero interest rate policy that has driven asset price inflation with investors chasing yield. The Fed is looking to normalize monetary policy after this sustained period of exceptionally low interest rates. We do not know when that will occur and every time we think it's gonna happen, it just keeps getting put off. But the one thing I'm sure of, it will surely occur. As a result, Investors, developers and lenders have mixed views about the future of commercial real estate values. I really like to be a bit controversial when I do these sorts of things. And I start from the position that real estate values and interest rates have no correlation over the long term. And we can come and debate that in a lecture one day and we can go through it. But if you look at it, property values and capitalization rates <clears throat> are driven by multiple factors. These include the rate of return demanded by institutional investors, supply and demand of that real estate, and the availability as well as the cost of debt. Over the last three decades, there have been eight key periods when the 10-year US Treasury has moved up. In five of those eight periods, cap rates have actually moved down. Only during the periods of December 1989 to October 1990, and October 1993 to November 94, and of course, during the financial crisis in November 2007 to 2008, did cap rates move up with interest rates? Our industry is way too focused on Fed policy and the decisions it makes about short-term interest rates. Real estate is much more affected by the availability of debt and the cost of long-term debt. And what we do is that we really look at the balance sheet with long-term fixed rate 10-year debt. <clears throat> As an example, in October of 2014, we issued at Westfield $500 million of 10-year bonds, unsecured bonds. The treasury rate was 1.72% uh, and our spread was 180 bips. So our all-in co borrowing cost in October 2014 was 3.375%. Two years later, we issued billion dollars of 10-year bonds. The Treasury happened to be 255, but our spread had lowered to 125 bips. Our all-in borrowing cost was 3.75%. So even though the Treasury rate had moved up by 80 basis points, our total borrowing cost only increased by 40 basis points over a 10-year period. From the way we look at the business and how we operate, that's virtually no change at all. Another factor that I think that must be considered is the availability of debt. Even though interest rates are historically low right now, there is still a lack of debt, which I saw in the forecast as well, uh, in the marketplace for anything except the better assets. This la lack of capital, or debt capital, has affected both transaction volumes and the values at the more moder moderate end of real estate, while there continues to be incredibly strong demand at the higher end. Finally, it's important to remember that if the Fed does raise interest rates, it should, and I stress should, 
be correlated with a strengthening in the economy, which would have higher expectations of consumer spending, which should lead to increases in rental growth, which should support the property values if the cap rates go down due to higher interest rates. So therefore, in line with the forecast, thank goodness with this, because we didn't see the forecast when I wrote the speech, I only saw it this morning, um, we think property values will be relatively stable. Instead of focusing on the short-term fluctuations in interest rates, we at Westfield keep our eye on the long-term trends. In thinking long-term, we look beyond the world of finance and real estate development. We consider all aspects of our future business, including technology. And I think this is the most important part for the mall business especially. Actually, I think every real estate and almost every business. There's been a revolution in the retail industry. We have seen dramatic changes in retail business models, consumer habits and technology. Since the financial crisis in 2009, consumers have changed their shopping patterns. They consume less, they spend more efficiently and they save more. On the back of that, technology has allowed retailers to penetrate markets without having a physical presence. As a result of these major changes, retailers need less stores. They need more efficient stores and they need higher volume stores. At Westfield, we have completely changed our business model over the last six years to mirror these changes in both the consumer, uh, the consumer patterns as well as the retailer's needs. And what we want to do is own and develop properties where retailers have to be. Since 2011, we've raised more than $4.5 billion through joint venturing 22 of our assets, and we have divested 29 assets for more than $6.7 billion. In 2010, we had 119 malls under management. Today, we have 34. In 2010, we did not have a single asset that did in excess of $1 billion or pounds or euros in gross sales. By 2020, after we finish this current development program, we will have 13 assets which, which will be doing in excess of one billion pounds, one billion dollars, or one billion euros. That's a complete change in the nature of, of the company. Traditionally, retailers develop, retailers, retail developers aggregated retailers on a piece of real estate and made it possible for consumers to come and buy as many goods and services in one stop and easily. Today at Westfield, we are not only aggregating retailers for consumers, we need to aggregate consumers for retailers. By innovating in both the physical and digital spaces, we are seeing a range of opportunities for us to create new revenue streams, streams for us and for the retailers. Three years ago, we created an innovation lab in San Francisco to move this forward at great expense, I might add. Westfield Labs is leading our drive to build a smart global network of digital experience across all of our flagship properties that connect retailers with shoppers and shoppers with retailers. We believe that digital can create an added element of interest, engagement and value to the customers in our physical assets. So now I'm gonna give you a vision a few years down the line of shopping at Century City or at London or at the World Trade Center, or in Topanga, or in Montgomery Mall. So just imagine this. Before you leave home, you open up our app, which of course you've downloaded because it's the best app you've ever seen. <laughs> Let's hope so. Um, you open up your app, and your app will tell you which is the quickest way to get to the mall through traffic, and which entry you should go in, presuming you're actually driving your own car. If not, it'll send a signal to the car that's driving you, and without you knowing it, you'll just roll up at our mall. Once you arrive at the centre, we will recognise that you're there. The boom gate at the entry to the, car, to the car park will open. We'll direct you to the closest and most convenient parking spot. As you get out of your car, get up the escalator, walk into the mall, we will use your recent browsing history to curate a personal shopping experience for yourselves based on retailers that you love and products that you're looking for. The retailers themselves will be able to download their entire inventory of SKUs into your phone. 
you will be able to search any product in the mall on your phone while you're there, while you're, and hopefully not while you're driving, but while you're there, when you get there, and look for the products that you want to buy. You'll be able to know if the products are available in the store. You can add them to a wish list or a shopping list, or you can just do research on a Christmas gift or what trending products are happening before you arrive. You'll be able to make restaurant reservations at the restaurants we put in, pre-order your lunch, dinner, or any food you have, buy dinner, uh, buy theatre tickets, or any other service that you actually desire. Similar to mapping blue dot technology, we will be able to guide you not just to the store that you want to visit, but to the product or to the item. With one click, we can serve you up whatever you're looking for, whether it's a special or a deal, or even a personal stylist, if that's what you need. We are using this expertise to provide a seamless customer experience at our airports as well. We do six airports in the country right now? Seven? Eight. Eight. Um, so I want you to think about this. This is really going to scare you. Um, we'll be able to enable travellers to browse, navigate and purchase at any time along their place in the journey. This will increase their comfort and efficiency of the trip from locating the gate to pre-ordering food to finding essentials that you may have left behind. All of this is going to be made, powerful, uh, made possible by leveraging the power of our shared data. We'll be able to know what you bought, what movies you saw, where you shopped, dined and travelled, as Amazon does today, by the way. We will have collective insight into shoppers' purchasing and browsing habits, geolocation and online activity. We can make the most of this data to benefit you, the customer. We have already created the technological backbone to connect our customers to these services. We are putting them in the malls right now. You'll see it at Century City as we're building it. You'll see it at the World Trade Center uh, as it opens. We are testing it today at Westfield, London. So now, if you live in New Jersey, and you shop at our Mall of Garden State Plaza, we will ping you. When you get on the PATH train and get out at the World Trade Center, we'll get you again. When you get in your Uber and you go out to JFK, depending what terminal you go to, we'll get you again. By the way, when you get out at LAX, we'll get you again. When you drive onto the west side at Century City or you go down to Topanga, we have you again. If you go to London, and you get on the train on your way down to Westfield, London, I'm sorry, folks, we get you again. And interestingly enough, with our partners in Australia, if you go to Sydney, they'll get you, but we'll get you again. So when you think about that, and you think about where we are, we're just in the mall business, and you think about the amount of investment that we have to make to do this, you think about online shopping and how it affects malls and how it affects physical retailers, we need to totally and utterly change our business model. We have 500 million customer visits a year, or after the World Trade Center, we will have 500 million customer visits a year. And we see a major opportunity to transform their experience and increase value for ourselves and our customers. Those 500 million visits are about 30 to 35 million people. A great example of what we do and how we think is the transformation that we're doing down the road here at Century City. I bought Century City and I didn't actually remember all these numbers till I wrote this speech and it's mind-boggling to me, let alone anybody else. In 2002, we acquired, Century, we acquired Century City, Dick, for $318 million. That's it. $318 million. Property at Bloomingdale's, Macy's, AMC Theatre, Gelson's and 90 shops and its retail sales were $200 million. And the centre was in the right place with a, one of the best markets, uh, the west side here has $14.1 billion of sales a year. 900,000 people live here. They spend as if they're 2 million people. And when we bought the centre and we looked at it, the whole idea is what could you make it? Where could it be? Because it was in the best part of town, yet it was not the best centre in town at the time. So, in 2000, between 2002 and 2005, actually in 2004 to be exact, we bought the two office buildings on the corner. We bought the Houlihan-Loki building behind 
where the parking structure is now, and we bought 1801 Avenue of the Stars so that we could expand the footprint of the real estate so we could expand the mall. That's 2004. We started building the transformation in June of 2015. By 2006, we did a, we did a, as we bought the two uh, properties, we also did an expansion to the mall, spent $170 million and added 100,000 square feet, moved the theatre to the back. Everyone at Shopsy will know what we did. By 2006, the sales had grown from $200 million to $400 million. Now, last June, we started an $800 million transformation of the mall. And as I said, it took us 10 years to design it, deal with the department stores, and work with the city. Uh, most people who I know used to look at me like I was nuts. Um, who, the question was, who would tear down 75% of a perfectly working mall and lose $30 million of NOI a year to do so? I think you have to be Australian. I, I just, you know, not sure anyone else would do that. At Century City, we'll add a new Nordstrom flagship store, the first Italy in town, which has created a lot of noise. 220 new specialty stores and destination food shops, and yes, Judy, the red and green lights. On completion, the mall will now be 1.3 million square feet. It will be a world-class, digitally integrated retail and lifestyle destination. And I keep saying this, the mall's going to change the shopping patterns on the west side of Los Angeles. We also designed the centre with the community in mind. The goal for us is to create a site that is interwoven into the very fabric of the west side of town so that neighbours, customers and everyone else will think of it as their local place. Now, here's the thing that blows my mind. When we are open and stabilised, the centre will do $1.3 billion of sales. In 2002, it did $200 million. In 2017, it will do $1.3 billion dollars. And from our point of view, the asset will be worth somewhere around three billion dollars itself. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to finish by saying to you, welcome to the future. Thank you.